Hello and welcome everyone to the 2021 Celebration of the Priesthood. I'm Alice Cook. And I'm Scott Wally and we're so delighted to be with you here tonight as we celebrate the work of our priests across the Archdiocese as they build stronger communities for all. Scott and I worked together for more than two decades covering sports and news stories here in Greater Boston. And yet I never realized during that time that it was really the Boston priest that created what we know today as Pine Street Inn. I think that's true of a lot of folks here in Greater Boston, Alice. And tonight you're gonna to see many, many ways in which our priests strengthen our parishes and our communities. They came from all over greater Boston and from different parts of our world. Like each of us, they had different stops along their paths. They played hockey, baseball, and football. They surfed. They went to prom and even served as the mascot for the New England Aquarium. They brought with them a love of music and Italian cooking. They attended some of the most prestigious colleges and universities in our nation. Where they studied foreign languages, astrophysics, American civilization, and medicine. They studied abroad. They went on to work in other countries. They served our country. And stood up for our communities. Some worked as data analysts and financial advisors. One practiced law and later cardiology. And before ordination, one was married for a short time before his young wife's illness called her home to God. They traveled many different paths, but along the way, they heard a greater calling. They forged new roads. They created vibrant parishes. and transformational schools. They created an inn for the homeless in Boston, worked with Mother Teresa helping the dying in the streets, and started a basketball league to give kids a place to get off the street and something to eat, then built a place to feed those most in need, with breakfast and dinner served 365 days a year. They renovate, communicate, organize, and evangelize. They support those with vocations. They support us. They stand with us. They care for us. They are there for us. Different paths, one mission, stronger communities. Our next story takes us from the 33rd floor of a building under construction in downtown Boston to the shores of Cape Cod and includes some great piano tunes along the way. Tom O'Brien is known by many in the greater Boston area for his work in developing extraordinary projects. Suffolk Downs, Bullfinch Crossing, and Boston Landing, just to name a few, with his firm HYM Investments. HYM, a name as you will see that will always be very close to his heart. This year, Tom and his wife, Tricia, have graciously stepped up to serve as co-chairs of the celebration of the priesthood. Their family story is one of faith in action, one that shows the importance of the support of our priests in our joys and in our sorrows, and it is one of hope. It is our pleasure to introduce all of you to the O'Brien family. If you were to give a, a name to your family story, what would it be? <laughs> Incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> We're still working on it. Still working on it. <laughs> when Tom and I met and got married, right away we knew we couldn't have, some ch have children and had some setbacks and some tough times. Um, so I said, I, I want a family. I don't care how this family is created. I want a family. I'm Lucas. I'm Tomas. I'm Nina. I'm Doretti. And so, it brought us to Bogota, Colombia, and we brought Lucas home in 1995. Um, and then it brought us to Guatemala, and we brought Nina home in 1997. And then it brought us to Ecuador, and we brought, it, brought Tomas home in 1999. And then we brought um, Marisol home from Guatemala in 2000. 
and we brought her to Reddy home from Ethiopia when she was six. I would always pray for each adoption, show me when God, when, 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 you know, when can we bring another child home? And Tom would just look at me and say, we're bringing another child home? <laughs> <laughs> but at that time we had four kids under the age of five. I just like don't think about it that much until people like bring it up and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess so, we're kind of <laughs> unique. We're just a family. Yeah. We would say after every adoption, no matter how this child came to earth, this child was meant for us and we were meant for this child. Brought Marisol home from Guatemala in 2001. First two years that she was with us, she was running around and, you know, just just like all the other kids. And then Very right, healthy. right away I, I, I could see there was something going on. And But eventually um, they told us she had this leukodystrophy. And Trish would stand up and say, we're not quitting. And so, you know, a lot of times we would be uh, dealing with something difficult with Marisol. We went to see Father McDonough over at the Mission Church, and he told us, he said, you don't realize this right now, but this is a gift that God gave you. Uh, Marisol died December 20th, 2008. Believe me, I got angry at God many, many times. I often thought about Father McDonough saying, someday you'll realize what a gift she was. And she was, <laughs> we were like the most blessed parents in the world. We have this beautiful little saint that we pray to, nearly every day, sometimes every hour. We had the presence, an amazing presence of a group of friends who were really amazing to us to help us and support us, uh, family um, and priests, you know, who were there for us to help pray over Marisol. I think that faith, especially in this family, has really brought us together. It's been something that has kept us together in the best and worst of times, you know, going to church and, you know, experiencing all of our sacraments individually um, and sharing those moments with family, but also with our greater community is something that um, was really unifying. With our sister's funeral, we had four priests do that mass. So we got to know them on like a different level and form those connections and become closer to the church. Our faith has been so important to both of us and so important to me. I've tried, we've tried to instill that in our children to know that no matter what is happening, they their relationship is with God, and that God loves them. Every time we'd be in the car driving somewhere, I'd say, okay, let's say a rosary. And we brought them to Mass all the time. Um, we just, we tried to make their relationship with God personal. Father Paul Rouse, he used to come over our house and play the piano and would all sing, and he became a really important priest in our lives, um, especially when our daughter was sick. And he gave her first communion um, in her eighth year, which is the year she died. We hadn't seen um, Father Rouse in years, and we talked to him on the phone, but just hadn't connected. And so we went over there, and her, it was, would have been Marisol's 21st birthday. And it was so emotional to come full circle and to see, to spend that day with Father Rouse. And it was beautiful because we had a Mass, and here we were on the on day she would have been 21, and it was surrounded by priests. And we walk in and there's this big, beautiful picture of Father Rouse in our home in Lexington when he gave her first communion. It was really exciting because I met Father Rouse when I was little, but seeing him again, and my parents were really happy seeing him again. And um, we had mass and we had lunch with um, some of the priests there and the cardinal, and it was just really nice. And then Father Coletti was the pastor at Sacred Heart. He was tremendous, gave us tremendous support. Um, during our time with Marisol. And then Monsignor um, Paul, who's there now, was wonderful. Father John Uni, who's a wonderful friend, has really been a, a key part of our lives. The priests that we've had growing up um, have had a strong impact on our lives. You feel kind of lost, you don't know how to feel. You feel all these different kinds of emotions when you lose a sibling, part of your family. And just having the church there, something to support you, to fall back on, uh, it was really important to all of us and it helped a lot. Tom has always been involved in government and he decided at that time to start a new company and he said I want to call it the HYM company. <laughs> so I said what's the HYM company? He said it's hold you me, which is what Marisol used to say when her words got mixed up. She would say hold you me mommy, hold you me. And I think Marisol has led him to his success um, at HYM. And when he was hiring for his company, I said, your company needs to reflect who our family is. It needs to look like our family. He's done a great job, and 
And he's tried to lead other real estate um, companies to do the same, and all companies do the same. You know, we are, uh, as a company, we're 50% women and 30% people of color. Um, and we built that company intentionally to be a place that is, uh, that, you know, that looks like the city of Boston. We've also worked to, to try and build bridges within the work that we do. So we're trying to do our part to make the city a stronger, better place uh, with stronger communities. We want to be part of an effort to help um, tell these priests that we thank them, that they deserve our support, and certainly as they retire and, and become seniors, that they definitely deserve um, you know, a life that is secure and healthy and, um, and filled with some joy. The job of being a priest is a 24-hour day job. To know that we're taken care of in their later years was just, again, so comforting and, and so right. You know, we should. They gave, they gave their lives to all of us. And now it's time for us to take care of them. Special thank you to Tricia and Tom for all they've done to support tonight's program and Clergy Trust. By the way, there will be more about the O'Briens, including information about the foundation they founded in Marisol's memory on the Clergy Trust website in the coming weeks. From serving our parish communities and those in need to even making arrangements for water slides <laughs> and music at an amazing vacation Bible school, Father Michael Nolan in Waltham and Father Matt Williams in Quincy are opening doors in many ways. My name is Father Matt Williams and I'm the blessed pastor of uh, St. John the Baptist and St. Joseph Parishes and we uh, call ourselves the St. Jay's Collaborative. We weren't created to live on islands. We were created to, to be a, a human family and with that, an ecclesial family. Inviting people to encounter Christ in, in the sacraments and the liturgy and also these wonderful moments of outreach where we've been able to meet people and get to know them and walk with them on this journey to Christ. During the pandemic, Father Matt really sort of ratcheted things up. I can't tell you how many different ministries and different you know retreats, virtual retreats, he created and started and followed through on during, uh, during this pandemic, you know, we had something basically every Thursday night for the first eight or nine months of the, of the pandemic where there'd be between 60 and 200 people on a Zoom call doing one of these sort of virtual retreats. From the beginning of the pandemic, I've been convinced of this fact. I said to my team, if we get Jesus right, we'll get everything right. So through the Joy Movement, we've been able to articulate there's a need where people are experiencing their spiritual poverty, where people are longing for something, hope in the midst of this pandemic. And we've got the remedy, his name is Jesus. So all of our parishioners as part of the Joy Movement, we invite them to pray 15 minutes. You can't give what you don't have, you can't lead where you've never been. The Joy Movement, Jesus, Others, Yourself, is how Father Matt talks to the parish about it especially in the time of pandemic when people were so disconnected, this parish came up and running right at you to connect. And the first person he told you you need to connect with is Jesus. And then we've just built this beautiful community around that. I don't have any family in the Massachusetts. So the church is my family. The joy movement was my family. The joy movement made it possible for me to survive the pandemic by finding prayers. The fact that the church was open, that you could go and do adoration, it was there for us. When I, we arrived here, um, there weren't a lot of young people and there weren't a lot of young families. And so that was one of the, it was the top pastoral need of our parishes. One of the most effective outreaches to families and young children is a vacation Bible school. And, and with that, we were able to reach out uh, and do some wonderful things. Two years ago with the Vacation Bible School, we had about 40 total participants. This past year was more than tripled in the course of two years. It blesses what's already going on and it invites them to something more. So I went to Vacation Bible School the first year it was happening. I would say it would give me like joy and happiness that I know God is with me all the time. 
I like to build things and they really give you an opportunity to give your time and talents to, to this parish. Vacation Bible School, I've been, this is my second year counseling, almost like a second home. Youth group is just, you build a community there. The work that they do, uh, it's incredible, it's God's work, it truly is. You know, and that really is all down to, uh, to the St. Jay's community. The goal is unity, to unite them to Christ, not only with their present day needs, but with their destiny. Not only their life now, but in the afterlife. St. Mary's is a parish that has, throughout its history and from its inception, minister to the immigrant populations who have come here for work and opportunity. So I was ordained a year ago this Sunday, tomorrow, and the first thing that I noticed in the parish was there was no division. You know, all the different cultures, languages, they all always came together at different points. And I was surprised by it. We support each other because I always live what God wants me to do where God sent me to go. When the pandemic broke out, we pivoted. We brought the Blessed Sacrament from our neighboring chapel uh, through the city of Waltham, through its main streets, asking the Lord to bless and protect not just the parishes, but all the citizens of Waltham. Then we immediately received a phone call from a woman outside the parish who ran a a food pantry. Healthy Waltham is a health and wellness organization that focuses on removing barriers to access. So we are currently feeding 950 to 1,000 families uh, twice a month. We could not have done this in any other place. She was told by the city that she could no longer use city property for a food distribution to help those who are in need of food. We put together in two weeks what would normally take six months to a year to plan. For us it wasn't just charity work, it was now an opportunity for us to encounter Christ. My name is Gloria, I'm a choir director. I drive like 40 minutes to come here to meet the Ugandan community. It has been a, a new community that is growing, is expanding. Our Mass is celebrated in Luganda, where we have drums, sometimes we dance, clap our hands and it's really a fun celebration. It's great being a part of this choir because everyone is very, very welcoming and understanding. People come from like all over different towns just to come and like bring their kids to be a part of it. I mean, Father Michael, he lets us do our cultures. He's always there, encouraging. We noticed that we had people who wanted to help younger children and accompany them and help them grow. So we set up an after-school program. What's different about us is that we bring them God. You have to, to care for the whole person. So we set up a structure where they do sport, uh, then they get a snack, then the second hour they receive help with their homework. Gives them a confidence. We found that with children, a lot of them are not learning to read well, so we built a library. Al principio, un niño no sabía ni leer ya terminando ese año académico ya te sabía leer algún libro ha habido avance de ver niños que que de repente nunca pensaron poder ir a la universidad y ahora vemos tenemos varios niños que ya fueron a la universidad if their minds bodies and souls are cared for at the end of the day their day ends up differently they go home as different people a veces falta ese líder para que el resto de gente se levante de lo que a veces nunca se levantó y estaba en casa sin hacer nada, pero ahora va y colabora, porque hay alguien que nos dijo, se tenemos que levantarnos, tenemos que hacer, tenemos que hacer comunidad, y esa es la comunidad de Santa María. Father Matt and Father Michael. 
We are grateful for your dedication and the dedication of all of our priests. Next, we meet two of the women trustees who help to lead clergy trust and the care of our priests. These women are accomplished business professionals who bring their talents and unique perspectives to clergy trust, all in support of our priests. What we do at Clergy Trust is to support the priests in our lives. The demands on them have really changed over the years. Many of them served in parishes into their 70s and 80s. People don't really give a lot of thought to what happens to priests when, they're, when their job is over, when they retire. Where do they go? How do they live? How are they supported? I want to take care of them um, because they've certainly taken care of me at different points in my life when I never even asked them to. president of Camp Harborview, which is a summer day camp and a year-round enrichment program for teens and their families. We really think we're building a better Boston because we want these kids to feel invested in their city. So by providing them with opportunities and removing barriers for them, they have chances to grow and develop into the leaders that we hope that they'll be and then they'll stay in the city and make it a strong, thriving community. I see a big overlap with what I do and what, with what the priests do. They spend most of their time building community, about making people feel invested in the community and feeling welcome in the community. And that's a lot like what we are trying to do at Camp Harbor View. So it, it's sort of a natural for me to be involved in this work. Interestingly enough, Jean Temple, who is on the board of the Clergy Trust and whom I think is just a fabulous role model for business women, said to me, we need more women involved in this effort and I need you. And I don't say no to Jean, so that's how I got here. I really feel honored to have been asked to do this work, to be part of this program. Um, it's just, I've, I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards. This one is exceedingly meaningful to me uh, because of the people we're supporting, so I'm just really happy to be part of it. I'm an independent contractor in the area of communications and business strategy. I have spent many years in corporate environments doing the same thing. The clergy Trust supports priests, both active priests and retired priests. And priests, uh, their role in community has changed over the years. Now you have one priest, one pastor, many times servicing a wide geographic area. He's got more uh, administrative responsibility. So the work at Clergy Trust is really for the active priests to make them more aware and equip them with the tools necessary to live a healthy life particularly given all the stress that they're handling. They never know when they're going to get a call to be um, present for somebody's hardest moments or the most joyous. And then there isn't a nuclear family to go back to to say, boy, I had a rough day. There's, there's not anyone there to hear that. So I think it's important for women to be involved in this work because we care deeply about the work that these priests have done. As trustees, there's policy making that goes on around the table. And to have different perspectives, and especially to have a female perspective, certainly the perspective of people who are accustomed to caregiving in their own lives, is really important to the policy making. There are three critical programs that the Clergy Trust supports. They are the Intentional Living Program, which provides preventive health and wellness programs for the 334 active and 202 senior priests. Creating that kind of awareness around the fact that it's not selfish to take care of yourself. It is selfless because you can go that much further. The second program is a dedicated care team, and that offers one-on-one -on -one support to priests with health concerns. The dedicated care team is the equivalent of a navigation system for your healthcare. We have so many resources at our disposal, but accessing them and accessing them in the right sequence is not something that happens naturally. And the third one is the Regina Cleary community, which cares for senior priests in a state-of-the-art facility where they can continue living their faith in community with other priests. The sense of community at Regina Cleary is really important for the men who live here. Among the men who reside here, there is a combined 2,800 years of service. To come to Regina Cleary is to be understood from the moment you walk through the door. They understand that each of them has a spiritual life, uh, and they share that spiritual life here. So this is special. This is really special. For most of us, our faith has been at least somewhat and significantly informed by the priests in our lives. They're there when we're baptized, when we received sacraments, and then when we had our families, when we buried relatives. I mean, all those things that are too numerous to count, when they were there, make 
me feel like for us to be there for them now is not an obligation, it's a privilege. Each year we gather to honor our priests at this annual priesthood dinner. This year, a very dear friend is missing from our midst. John Caneb, who was so active in helping to launch this wonderful initiative and who has been such a great friend of our priests and the whole community, he has gone home to God and this year our hearts are sorrowful because of the separation, but we are so grateful for his life, for his faith, for all that he has accomplished with his beautiful family, the wonderful ministries that he was involved in, Catholic charities, Catholic schools, prison reform. He was truly a Renaissance man. We will miss him very much, but his good deeds live on after him and his friendship is something that we all cherish in our hearts. Today we want to express our condolences to his dear wife Ginny, to his six sons and, and all of his grandchildren and extended family. Today as we once again celebrate the priesthood, we also celebrate the memory of this great friend of the priest, John Caneb. May he rest in peace. May the Lord have him in glory and reward his goodness, his witness, and his virtue. In one of his major writings, St. John Paul II reminds us that God has promised to never leave his people without shepherds to gather them and guide them. The journey from seminarian to parish priest is one that includes years and years of study with invaluable lessons shared from generation to generation. Our next story is dedicated to the memory of Father John Connolly, who until just a few weeks ago, at age 98, was the oldest living priest in the Archdiocese, and the last, by the way, to have fought for our country in World War II. Before going home to God, he served 71 years as a priest. Father Connolly passed away during the filming of our program but his legacy of teaching others lives on. The goal is to form priests who will be serving the people of God, but also to teach them, to help them grow in the faith. That's what we're trying to do. That's what they try to do with me, is, is to form shepherds after God's own heart. We're representing Jesus. We're literally the voice of Christ. It's not just our voice, it has to be our heart that follows Jesus. You could ask anybody in my class, who did Father Connolly pick on? It was me. He would ask a question to the class, and he'd say, well, what do you think? Mark? Father Connolly did not retire from theology. He barely retired from being a pastor. He was a pastor for a long time. But the man would get up every day in his 90s and study theology. As a bishop, I, I have theological questions. I still go to him. Father Conley, in my experience, manifested a wonderful coalescence, if you will, of the philosophy, the theology, but also the pastoral practice. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't just theory. For him, it was something that you put into action. One of his great uh, lines used to be to us in class, uh, uh, you need to think theologically so that your faith is being expressed in a way that would be helpful, intelligent, and motivating for the uh, average parishioner to grow in his or her faith. You know, anyone can smile um, and shake hands at the door of a church, um, but to really be able to follow up afterwards, once people become comfortable with you and they open up um, and share with you their deepest questions or their deepest hurts, you're gonna need something more than a smile at that point to help them. Um, and that's where all the theology comes into play. Uh, and so we have the four pillars of formation, uh, human, intellectual, uh, spiritual, and pastoral. 
uh, basically so that a priest can be um, what St. Paul envisioned, you know, a man who is all things to all people, uh, whose personality can become a bridge rather than an obstacle uh, to the message of the gospel. A couple of the, my former students, a couple of priests came up to me and uh, said, you know, you know, people, uh, that come to me for help, uh, it's, it's usually there's some difficulty in their life. And after I meet them on that human pastoral level, then they're able to open their soul. But first they need a bridge, and you taught us that the priest is the bridge. I was a student of Father Conley, and of the priests that he had today, I taught all of them. So, Father Salux, uh, I taught, I had him in class. Uh, Father Grimes taught me, but he also taught Bishop uh, O'Connell and Father Stam. I taught Bishop O'Connell and Father Stam. Uh, and this is going to keep on going. I'm very conscious of the responsibility that we have to produce the next generation of parish priests who are going to have concrete impacts on the lives of uh, so many hundreds of thousands of people here in the Archdiocese. I'm in the line of succession of, of apostles. That's extremely important to carry on the faith and to, to carry on the sacraments. That's a tremendous responsibility. At the end of the day, we are all brothers and we're working towards a common mission. And we have this one love for Jesus Christ and for his people in the Archdiocese, and that's what binds us together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Archbishop of Boston, Cardinal Sean O'Malley. My dear friends, I'm pleased to gather with you all virtually this evening to celebrate the ministry of our brother priests and the work they do for our communities and the church. St. John Vianney, the patron saint of the parish priests, would share with the people he served that a priest is not a priest for himself. He is a priest for you. The profiles featured in tonight's program are examples of that dedication lived in our midst today. Our priests come from so many different backgrounds and experiences with one mission in mind, to serve others. As Archbishop of Boston, I am privileged to witness firsthand how they carry out that mission every day, especially during the last 18 months when they rose to the occasion and the challenge of developing innovative and creative solutions to keep our parish communities connected and in help to those in need. I hope my brother priests would agree with me when I say that our vocation is a tremendous blessing, one that brings us so much joy and grace. This event is particularly meaningful because it gives Catholics as well as people of all faiths an opportunity to express their appreciation for the service of our priests and provides us with an opportunity to thank you, our parishioners, friends, and benefactors, for the gift of your presence in the, our lives. On behalf of my brothers in Christ, thank you for your support and your participation here tonight, for sharing your faith journeys with us, for inviting us into your lives, Please know of our gratitude for the opportunity to bring the presence of the Lord to you, your families, loved ones, and friends. It's a long-standing tradition for priests to sing the Salve Regina at the closing of liturgies and also for special events that call to mind the blessing 
of our gift of priesthood. Joined by Father Oscar Pratt and Father Eric Caden and my brother priests, we will close tonight's program by singing the Salve Regina together. God bless all of you and thank you again for joining us this evening. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Tuccedo, Espes Nostra Salve. A te clamamos, Jesus Resili Hebe, A te suspiramos, Gementes et lentes, In hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, Advocata nostra, Thanks for being with us for the celebration of the Priesthood 2021. And many thanks for the work of the priests of the Archdiocese of Boston as they continue to open doors to stronger communities for all of us. Thank you to all of our sponsors. And to all who have supported Clergy Trust and tonight's celebration. 